It is my pleasure to introduce Luke Norris from Code for America. He is the facilitator for this plenary. This is a very 21st century topic. Open data plus civic hackers equals new technology for age-old problems, an algorithm that no doubt we will be hearing about uh, from our facilitator and his panelists. Uh, Luke Norris is the Director of Government Relations for Code for America. This is a national nonprofit based in San Francisco, but he lives and works in Kansas City where I'm sure he finds the cost of living and the availability of housing a lot more reasonable uh, than he might in, in home office. And so again, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Luke Norris. He will introduce his panelists and we're looking forward to looking at big data. Ah, here's Luke Norris. All right. Well, thanks so much, uh, and uh, I do hope that uh, some of you find what we're gonna talk about slightly mischievous, but also uh, achievable. Um, so uh, I wanted to share with you uh, a few things that we're seeing nationally uh, from our perspective at Code for America. Um, but also try to provide you with some actionable ideas on things that you can actually take home to your communities, um, but also share with you some examples, some ideas of things that are actually taking place when you bring together citizens, you leverage technology in new ways, and you think about the power of open data. So that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today, and I'm going to share some examples of what we're seeing nationally and then talk with three amazing folks who are working at various levels of government to understand what they're doing both in their organizations uh, but also in their communities. So uh, first I wanted to provide you a little bit of an overview uh, of about Code for America. Uh, we are a national nonprofit based in San Francisco uh, and for the past five years we've been working with cities and counties and states uh, around the U.S. to uh, explore what happens when you leverage technology in new ways and you bring citizens to bear against some of the most critical issues in your city. And we were really started uh, five years ago with the idea of what happens and what can happen when you do that. Um, so for the last five years, we've really been showing what's possible through that approach. But we've also had the opportunity to reflect on our experiences in those 30 communities, as well as look nationally and look globally at things that are happening in cities around the U.S. and explore how those can become actionable uh, things. So uh, what I wanted to do is, is share with you a little bit about some of those uh, things that we're seeing. So we describe these as principles for 21st century government. Um, these are, again, observations of principles that we've seen leading to efficient, innovative, and highly effective governments around the U.S. And I'm going to share with you uh, a little bit about each of those principles and some of the examples and ideas that I hope you can take home uh, to your communities. So the first is about designing for people's needs. Uh, many of you that are urban planners probably use these same type of practices when you do charrettes, you engage citizens. But what happens if you try to do that in a technological component? What happens when you try to do that in improving digital services within your community and thinking about the way that you approach design from a digital service delivery standpoint? How can you make those digital services simple, beautiful, and easy to use? So we're finding that 21st century governments are conducting research with real people to understand their needs, understand their behaviors, and understand the way that they use technology. We're also finding that they're designing processes, designing policies, and they're designing services around those user needs. Not just once, but continuously. And so as a result of that, we're seeing that in some cities, you're eliminating this gap between policy and service delivery by actually iterating on that in real time. So I wanted to share with you an example of something uh, that we worked on. Um, anyone from Boston? Okay, so a couple years ago, this probably ended up in your mail, right? It's a 38-page PDF, and it has all of the information that you had to know about what school your students or your children could go to, right? So imagine getting it in the mail. You probably can't even read it from where you're sitting, right? And it's on a massive screen. Well, that's what our parents had to rely on. And so our fellows originally went in to work with Mayor Menino and his team uh, to work on the issue of opening up student achievement data. 
Um, but at the same time we were there, the Boston Globe wrote an article that basically said the process by which families have to select the schools that they go to is way too cumbersome, way too difficult, and it's because it was a 38-page PDF. So our fellows created Discover BPS, which is a Yelp-like tool that now provides an interactive way for individuals to get information about their schools, put in their address, and find information that's relevant and actionable to them. A couple of things that I wanted to highlight about this use of technology. It was informed because of a user need, and the way that we built it was based on the behaviors of how those people want to interact with technology and how they're actually working with similar technology in their day-to-day -day lives. But this is what we found, right? This is what uh, the, the superintendent of school said. She said it changed the way that we relate with parents and students. So think about that. The way that you design these critical government services can fundamentally change the relationship that you have with citizens, both by driving a, you know, transparency but also creating new, stronger relationships that build community. The other reason that I mentioned this is it's a great example of where we've seen lean and iterative approaches to uh, developing technology actually have a significant impact in the efficiency and cost savings of government. So Bill Oates, who was the uh, CIO for the city of, Chicago, or, uh, city of Boston at this time and is now the CIO for the, the Commonwealth, uh, we actually asked him, you know, had you tried to do this on your own, um, what do you think the outcome would have been? And he said, well, the outcome would have been probably two years of a project and probably $2 million worth of investment. Our fellows built this in 12 weeks. And they did it by leveraging community members' behaviors, understanding their needs, and leveraging lean iterative processes to build technology. So another example that I wanted to share uh, comes from some work actually that we did with the city and county of San Francisco. And so as, as you think about you know, smart growth, um, obviously the health of your community is something that all of you think about. So imagine this letter ending up in your mailbox um, and it maybe is addressed to someone who doesn't even live there anymore. Well, this was an actual problem for thousands of individuals in the city and county uh, of San Francisco who were on food stamp programs. So the problem was that they were getting these letters that they actually may not ever receive because they were sent to addresses that they no longer live at because that was the only way that the government ever tried to connect with them. And so if you're an individual on a food stamp program, imagine walking into a grocery store, you go to slide your EBT card, and you find out that you have no money on it. And you actually have no money on it because you didn't re-enroll in your benefits. So this was a really significant problem, and it was a problem that we explored uh, with the city and county and ended up finding a couple of ways uh, to actually help them uh, go about promoting healthy uh, living in their city. So the first was uh, we helped them understand how to take kind of an iterative approach to actually capturing new data. Right? Why aren't you asking if the individual has an email address? Why aren't you asking if they have a cell phone number? So in the process of doing that, we actually found that these individuals were, yes, more likely to have a cell phone, more likely to keep that cell phone number than they were their home address. And as a result of it, we created an application called Promptly, which now sends text, messages, uh, text message alerts to individuals in 15 different languages to let them know that their food benefits are going to expire. And so I'd love to tell you that this made an, a drastic and significant impact. It did in the way that it actually peeled back the onion and helped us realize an even bigger problem, right? So you'll see here that it's directing people to a, a phone number. Well, as we actually started to watch again the user behavior, we found that 73% of the people that called to renew their benefits actually ended up hanging up the phone within 30 seconds because they had 45-minute wait times. So now we've taken it a step further to actually helping create technology that gets that person a phone call back when it's their time to re-enroll in benefits. So again, it's not only helped the government be more efficient and not do more paperwork, but it's also improved the relationship and interaction with residents. So the, the next capability uh, or principle that I wanted to talk about is how do you make it easy for everyone to participate? Um, so again, when you think about planning, you think about equitable development, you think about these themes, how do you make sure that you're having the most inclusive participation possible? So we're finding the 21st century governments are again creating ways for every community member to take part in decisions that actually affect them and their daily lives. You're using language that is communicating in easy ways to understand and you're using technology that is accessible to everyone. So let me share a couple of examples of how we've seen this work. So uh, the city of Philadelphia um, wanted to reinvent how town hall work. 
Uh, how many of you have been to a town hall meeting? Okay, so obviously uh, a, a non-original sample size. But um, we actually find that most of those people end up going to meetings once and they end up either never coming back um, or they actually never find a way to participate. And it's because we all know town hall forums tend to be at 6 o'clock at night in a room that holds 30 people at City Hall, at County Hall, uh, and you have no idea of when those meetings are actually taking place. So with that idea in mind, we started to understand how citizens are using technology, right? Um, they have smartphones. They have phones, right? They're interacting with key governmental services in their day-to-day -day lives, whether it's standing in line to apply for food benefits or it's standing at a bus stop. These are critical places where you can capture feedback from residents. So what we actually ended up working on, uh, the city of Philadelphia, was creating a, a, an application called Textizen. And so as you see, they put these posters around the city with an, uh, a, a phone number on it, and individuals now could text message in responses um, to actually provide their input and provide their feedback about key decisions of whether or not another bus lane should be here, should a bike stop be here, would you rather see a shopping mall or would you rather see a school. So think about how you can use technology like this in a very lightweight way, again, to reach citizens where they're at, but reach citizens across a variety of uh, socioeconomic boundaries. So another uh, example that I wanted to share with you uh, comes from South Bend, Indiana. So uh, for most of you that you know, probably are familiar with some of the ways that the, the upper Midwest has been impacted uh, and, and the need for revitalization, South Bend was a, a city that had a, a significant issue with vacant and abandoned housing. And so the mayor, uh, when he took office, said, uh, we're going to deal with 1,000 homes in 1,000 days. And so as a part of that initiative, they wanted to figure out how they could engage citizens in providing feedback about vacant and abandoned properties, right? Is this a house that has had criminal activity, drug activity? Um, is it something that you think is safe, unsafe? Should we demolish it, whatever the case might be? And so um, thinking about how users use technology, of course they could have gone and just built a website, right? But the reality is that a lot of the people don't have computers. They work during the day, so they can't go to meetings or sessions during the day. They may not be comfortable with text messaging, but they mostly all understand how to use a telephone. So they created an application that uh, allowed individuals to call in using a unique ID and a phone number and provide feedback. And so the result of it was within the first uh, month of the application being live, uh, they had received feedback on over 100 pieces of property, some of those getting as many of, as eight calls. And those calls ranged from things like this is a house that has continued to have drug activity. Um, we are confident that it used to be a meth lab. Um, to conversations like, that's my grandma's house. I didn't know that I could potentially buy that house. Will you please contact me? So again, some of the ways that it's actually provided information and put information in people's hands and allowed them to participate in a new way. So for those of you that are uh, passionate about urban planning and, and street design, uh, this is an application called Street Mix that was created by a team of entrepreneurs uh, in San Francisco. And Street Mix is, is a fun, interactive application that allows people to come in and create harebrained ideas for what streets and cities should look like, right? Whoever thinks that you should put a bike lane in the middle of, uh, of the street uh, and you should have four lanes of traffic, Anyways, all of that is information that now is powering data that planning organizations are able to use, right? So uh, individuals in Broward County have actually really found aggressive ways or assertive ways to use this, some of which include setting up laptops at high schools, setting up laptops in front of youth and in front of other citizens and letting them just play with it, and then using all of the data from the back end of this system to actually inform decisions about how they design streets and roads. So the, the next principle I wanted to talk about is, is building capacity through collaboration. Um, most of you are probably in a city uh, that has uh, universities, has corporations, has entrepreneurs, or has citizens that would prefer to give their time to working on projects with you rather than volunteering for Big Brothers Big Sisters, working at the Boys and Girls Club. How do you tap into and how do you make it accessible for those people to engage? Well, that's what we're actually finding with some really innovative, forward-looking cities that are finding ways to collaborate. So they're developing relationships with outside partners. They're working towards common goals. They're finding ways to borrow existing work that's been done not only in other municipalities, but also through technology that's been built in other circumstances and repurposing it. 
And ultimately, they're making it easy for people to work with them, right? They're eliminating some of the barriers that have traditionally prevent, present, or prevented people from being able to participate. A lot of that points on issues around data, and we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. So uh, this is a program called Large Lots. Um, it's, a, it's an initiative uh, that grew out of a neighborhood-level pilot, okay? So there was uh, a point in time in Chicago where there were 10,000 parcels of land that the city of Chicago wanted to sell. Um, a team of, uh, of neighborhood leaders actually got together and said, um, this isn't working, right? If, if someone wants to come out and find out if they can buy that piece of land next to them, they have to go to the city's website, then they have to go to the county's website to check the tax roll, understand all of this information. They then have to go back and find all of this information about their own homeownership on the block. And so this group of, of citizens actually partnered up with another organization and said, how can we make this more accessible and how can we make it easier for people to actually participate in revitalizing their community? And so the program now uh, is, is powered by a stream of open data, um, both from the city and from the county. And so in the original neighborhood pilot of 4,000 homes, they had over 500 individuals uh, actually apply for the opportunity to buy those homes. And so if you lived on the block, you didn't owe any money, you agreed to hold the uh, you know, project for at least, or the piece of land for five years, you could buy it. So pretty amazing results. But then the problem became that as they had all of these people actually applying for it, it took two, sometimes three weeks to actually process it because it was all done by manual paperwork. So they didn't just stop there. They actually took it another step forward, right? This is a community group working with LISC working with the city, working with the county, and organizing at a neighborhood level to create this type of technology to make it more effective for individuals to actually play a role in rebounding and revitalizing their economy, buying vacant parcels of land, turning them into community gardens, and improving their neighborhoods. So another example of uh, how many of you have tried to go to a website and find information really quickly and easily uh, on your government website, right? Probably most of us. How many of you have found it to be very easy and really, really effective? Okay, right. So uh, we actually uh, had that same problem in, in uh, Honolulu, Hawaii, one of our first uh, projects that we worked on. Um, so the city basically said, it's way too difficult to find key pieces of information. So how do we make standard searches that people are doing far more accessible, right? How do you actually get the information to the people uh, in a more effective way? So our, our fellows worked with the city and actually, uh, m most of you have probably heard of hackathons, right? Um, well, they actually flipped it on its head and called it a write-a-thon. And so they engaged 300 individuals from around the community to come in and create the first crowdsourced website that actually does all of this information uh, for uh, making it far more accessible. So the next one is about making data easy to use and easy to find. Um, and for most of you, uh, you have tons of data, right? It's just not in usable formats. It's not in a place uh, where citizens can access it. It's not in a place where entrepreneurs can access it to actually do really great work. And so some of the ways that we've seen that actually fold out are in uh, examples like uh, Text My Bus. So uh, a team of uh, entrepreneurs actually worked with the city of Detroit to release data in their GTFS uh, format. And as a result of it now, uh, something like uh, 400,000 uh, messages have been responded to and over 600 people are using an app every day to find out whether or not their bus is going to be on time. And they're able to do that because the city already has real-time tracking devices on their GPS, but typically they had just been pushing it to a static PDF that was only uploaded once a quarter. Well, now because it's powered by a data mechanism and an API, it now can be accessible to hundreds and hundreds of people every single day. When you think about also the, the impact of data, right, the city and county of Los Angeles, or the city of Los Angeles uh, posted health inspection scores on restaurants, right? You've probably seen the grade scores A, B, C, and D. Well, if you wanted to find that information previously, you had to go to a website, you had to know where to look for the information, and you had to be able to understand what it was. So we've actually seen cities work on developing data standards that now make information like that accessible to millions of people on platforms that they're already using. A great example is on Yelp, right? So now you can come onto Yelp and you can see the actual food inspection score. 
What's interesting about that is studies found that when L.A. posted that information on restaurants and on their front doors, they saw a 13% decrease in the amount of hospitalizations due to foodborne illnesses. So think about when that information now becomes accessible to millions of people. This is another app that's a, a great example of where technologists at a local level have stepped up to help uh, improve uh, environmental conditions in their city. So uh, this, was, uh, com this came out of a discussion uh, at, a, at a hackathon in an event where uh, the public health department from Chicago said, we need to find a way to help people get better flu shots and get more people immunized. And so uh, a group of technologists said, well, how do people know where to find it? Well, the problem was, again, you had to go to a website where you couldn't necessarily get to the information easily or find it accessible. And so they created Flu Shot Finder, which is an application that now has rolled out uh, in a variety of cities. And again, it's just powered by simple open data and built in an interface that makes it easy for people to find information in a quick, streamlined way. So when you think about data, it's, the next step is how do you actually use data to make and improve decisions, right? And so we're finding that governments uh, that are working in the 21st century are making public data available by de default in these digital formats. So again, they can be accessible. A good example of where we're seeing uh, really effective uh, use of data is in procurement, right? So I'm sure all of you love your procurement systems, right? So one of the things is, what happens if you actually start to use data in procurement? So there's a tool called Smart Procure uh, that basically is collecting information from government agencies. Um, there are over 89,000 government agencies spending $7 trillion a year on purchases, right? What they're actually doing is they're using purchase order intelligence to now create a platform so people can make smarter buying decisions. So what they actually found is 91% of governments we're buying HP laser jet printers at a cost far greater than the government minimum. So what does that mean? Well, think about it in the context of your city. And we actually did that with the city of, of New York. And we asked their deputy comptroller, what would happen if you were able to use data and intelligence like this? And he basically said, what if we could just save 1%, right? And so 1% of the city's entire budget of $11 billion dollars could net out a million, hundred million dollars in savings in a year just from using data to make smarter purchases. Think about that hundred million dollars and what that could go to in your communities. So is Matt Hample here? If you haven't met Matt Hample, uh, you definitely should. He was uh, participating in the Civic Tech Fair yesterday uh, and is, works with a company called Local Data. Um, Local Data is making data and information accessible uh, or easily accessible so that individuals like you can go around and collect and analyze data about your community. This is actually the, the mayor of Gary, Indiana. Um, local data worked with them on a project that captured information on 60,000 pieces of land. And as a result of using that data, they were actually able to drive for $6 million uh, in governmental uh, hardship funding. Uh, and the impact has not only brought together citizens, but helped them understand predictive modeling in terms of demolishing and understanding the cost of demolishing properties. So I'm running out of time, but I wanted to share with you a couple of examples of, of the couple of last principles. Uh, and again, if you're following online, uh, we'd love your feedback on this. So how do you choose the right technology for the job, right? When you think about procurement and you think about the barriers that that sometimes presents, how can you get creative in actually getting the right tools and right technology for the job? And so we're seeing cities completely blow up the way they think about traditionally procuring services. This is Mayor Kevin Falconer from uh, the city of San Diego. They were going to build a brand new website and had a massive single RFP uh, that basically was, we want one person to come in and build from soup to nuts a website for us. Well, so in thinking about how they could do that in a more effective way and how they could seed some of that business to their local economy, they actually broke it up into a series of smaller RFPs. So now these local vendors can contribute ideas and contribute uh, technology uh, at project costs of twenty-five dollars or $50,000, where they don't have to have a $10 million insurance umbrella or things like that. We're also seeing it in projects like uh, what's happening in, in Philadelphia. So Philadelphia is saying, what happens if you start with the problem? So instead of prescribing what the actual solution is, how do you ask people to actually help bring solutions to these problems? So don't do these traditional RFPs that don't actually get you the right technology for the right job.
from a policymaker standpoint, we're seeing cities like Kansas City, Missouri actually implement uh, innovation policies that make it uh, easily accessible for entrepreneurs to test and commercialize their information on government's platform. And so the seventh principle that I want to share with you and the final principle is how do you organize for results? So we're finding that lean, iterative approaches to not only problem solving, but process development, policy development, and technology development are making significant impacts. And so how do you go about organizing an organization that allows for that? Well, there's a couple of examples of things that we've seen that have been really amazing. This is a program out of Denver called Peak Academy. And so Peak Academy is an initiative that is basically aimed at training their entire workforce as green belts in Six Sigma and lean methodologies. And so as a result of it, they've seen significant cost savings because they're decentralizing innovation. So now everyone can innovate. A good example is a woman that worked in their mail center actually was able to find out that there was no reason to send certified mail. In one week, she was able to save the, uh, her local government $60,000 by deciding that they no longer needed to send certified mail. So it put the power in her hands and now she's able to innovate. Cities like Philadelphia are creating innovation academies that are training executives and training leaders in how to do innovative work in their own organizations. So I share all of these with you as, as ideas and examples of things that we're seeing. And as you apply these principles not only to your work, we believe that they can not only help create more sustainable governments, but actually yield more sustainable communities. And so we're going to talk with some of our panelists here in a few minutes about some of those. Uh, I would just share with you that the, the, these principles are the way that we go about doing our work at Code for America. And going forward, we're going to start aligning all of that effort in key, three key focus areas, health, economic development, and safety and justice. We continue to look for really great, innovative, forward-looking partners around local government to help us accomplish that goal. So if you have an interest in, in engaging uh, with Code for America, talking about our fellowship, and you have critical needs and want to think about how to use technology in new ways to advance uh, opportunities in your area uh, around those kind of three focus areas, uh, we'd love to hear from you. And of course, you can find more information on codeforamerica.org. So uh, with that, thank you very much, and we will start the discussion. Uh, I would like to invite Tom, Denise, and Steve up to the stage, and we'll have a little bit of a discussion about open data and civic tech. First off, uh, starting on your left, uh, is uh, Denise Taylor. Denise is the Director of Communications and Community Engagement for the City of Somerville, Massachusetts. Uh, and she'll actually uh, be one of our partners this year for the 2015 Code for America Fellowship, um, which will actually be looking at how do you build to tools uh, to make data-informed decisions about real-time interventions uh, in the lives of school-aged uh, population uh, and cities or uh, students. Um, Denise also oversees the city's resident stat data sharing uh, and civic engagement por uh, program, uh, which brings the city, uh, the work of the city's summer stat office uh, for data analytics uh, and innovation directly to the public. So Denise will be a great value add. Uh, sitting next to her is Steve Hansen. Uh, Steve is a council member that represents Sacramento's fourth council district uh, and has been in office since 2012, uh, which also includes the historic midtown and downtown neighborhoods, uh, land park, river oaks, uh, communities. Uh, for the last decade, Steve has uh, lived and cared deeply for Sacramento. Uh, he's worked in his, as an advocate for neighborhoods, civil rights, and responsive government, uh, as well as, uh, as a resident. Um, he's active in his uh, local neighborhood association, so he'll be able to give a great perspective as a local policymaker. Uh, and then Tom Gurton. Uh, Tom's going to age himself by something I'm going to say in here that I didn't know. Uh, but Tom is the chief digital officer for the state of Rhode Island. Uh, he oversees all of their technology and strategy, uh, working on some massive projects that include the launch of their Health Source Rhode Island, uh, multiple agency website redesigns, uh, and modernizing an entire tax system, um, as well as working on the statewide e-permitting initiative. Uh, he's lived in or launched the Rhode Island uh, Transparency Portal, established a partnership with Code for America. We actually worked with Tom and his team last year on a project around education. Uh, he's the chair of uh, a number of lean process reengineering teams uh, and also works with state agencies uh, to prevent duplication of systems. Um, here's, here's the part that is going to age Tom. So uh, Tom was one of the first five employees to launch Monster.com in 1994. Yes. 
Wow. So, uh, well, thanks uh, all of you for joining us, and it's great to have your perspective. Um, I think what we're going to do is ask just kind of a series of questions, uh, and certainly uh, if we ask a question to, to one of the panelists and you feel like you can also contribute, feel free to jump in. Um, Steve, I, I would maybe like to start with you. So, you know, as you think about a, a council member's perspective and your role in Sacramento, uh, you've been a big champion for using data to, like, break down silos, um, create uh, better engagement, break down some of the engagement barriers, and create transparency to make government more effective. Um, can you talk about the measures, though, that you've taken um, and the changes you anticipate as a, res as a result? Um, like, what, what are you actually hoping to see as an outcome from that? Well, good morning, everybody. I hope that um, you're all awake because this is going to be fun. So first, let me say, I come at this from a certain philosophical perspective about why innovation is important in government and what kind of driving ethos we should have. Um, when you look at the technology solutions, I think it's hard to connect sometimes to why, I mean, it's easy when you look at problems we might want to solve, but what's the underlying philosophy? And for me, it's that whole idea of engagement and trust and openness. But very quickly in my term, I asked the city to adopt um, the Citizenville Challenge, which is uh, from a book that Gavin Newsom wrote, who's our lieutenant governor. And it basically follows somewhat along the lines of the principles that Luke laid out, but open data was a key part of that. And as we talked to our staff about implementing this open data portal and some of the other um, innovations there, what we found is that open data actually saves money. And for many of us, we have to comply with uh, Public Records Act requests or other Freedom of Information Act requests. And what we did is we put the most frequently requested data sets up online and we constantly updated them, which turned out not to be very hard using our IT staff. And we have a wonderful uh, chief uh, information officer named Maria McGonigal. And she really was eager to do this because we, we would save a lot of money. And it would allow her staff to spend less time going and pulling records out of an antiquated record management system and allow it to be up there and, and more effective. Um, so that's one of the examples. And we, we also, just based on that, that trust idea, uh, right after I got elected, we had a series of armed robberies in one of my neighborhoods. And at the community meeting where we were talking about that, there are several other issues that came up as really important to my residents. I have urban residents. And they told me that one of the biggest problems they were facing was bicycle theft. And it hadn't, because of the recession, we'd cut back um, in our police department. And, you know, there are a lot of things going on. But what we decided is that bicycle theft was sort of a uh, fundamental issue that undermined the trust that people had in city government and in our police department. So what we decided to do is we created a uh, backbone, um, free online registry, so you could register your bikes. Because we had recovered bikes that we knew had been stolen, but couldn't be returned to the rightful owners. And then we paired that with some other education initiatives. But what we found is that simply creating that free registry using technology, it's called rideon.org, uh, uh, rideon.sacpd.org, is we, we helped people know that we cared about more than just the murder and mayhem. We actually cared about the things that might affect their lives because it was unlikely in, in our city that the types of crime like an armed robbery would actually happen to a particular set of individuals, but bike theft was really rampant, and we wanted to show that we could do something about it. That's interesting. So one of the you know, things that I, I think we certainly have tried to champion at Code for America is opening data, um, but what you're actually talking about is opening data and using data not just for the purposes of, of doing it, but actually to use the information in meaningful ways. So that's super helpful. Um, Denise, uh, in, in Somerville, uh, I'd love to hear, uh, as probably one of the most innovative and forward-looking cities uh, that I've had the chance to work with, uh, and a city that has used data so prolifically across the entire organization, could you share a couple of examples maybe of, of where you've been able to use open data and technology to help advance some of the cities? Uh, resiliency or sustainability efforts? Sure. So um, the city of Somerville does have an open data portal. We push out uh, a good bit of data through that, and we also have our own data dashboard, which we coded ourselves and is open source. If anybody wants to code from it, it's somervillema.gov slash dashboard. Um, 
so we do put out a lot of data, but we also, there's a flip side to this, and that's that we also use data coming in to guide sustainability and smart growth. Um, one in example that's really interesting to me um, that we used in terms of uh, sustainability is uh, we have a happiness survey. So the city um, once a year surveys residents on their levels of well-being, contentment on a lot of different levels, but we also just ask how happy are you? So that's uh, an international standard that you can use for that. And we pushed that data out and a uh, resident who happened to be um, a very skilled analyst and mathematician um, asked if he could do some analysis of the data. So he did all of this for free. And one of the things that he was able to do that we hadn't even considered is he took out other data that we had pushed out about our tree inventory. We have a map of every, uh, a GIS map out of every tree in the city. And he was able to correlate by removing every other factor uh, in, in terms of income or um, anything else that could have complicated this. He was able to show that residents who lived near um, more trees were happier than other residents. <laughs> And we had been working on a push to expand our tree canopy, and this just became one more piece of data we were able to take out to the community as we talked about why this was a good investment. You know, we were looking at this from a sustainability perspective because it reduces our carbon load. We were looking at it from a safety perspective because more trees on urban streets slows traffic. But we were able to come out with this other argument, um, which is that it'll also make everybody a little bit happier. <laughs> And um, anyway, I thought that was interesting. But the other thing is that we're also using other data that's out there. So when you're thinking about can, can we afford to gather this data, you, there's a lot of free data that can help with smart growth. I mean, we use American uh, census uh, uh, survey data um, just for simple things like how many residents in the city have cars. Um, we also have been using um, Bluetooth data. So uh, when people are, we have a major development, smart growth development, transit oriented development going on around a new uh, subway stop that's coming in. And um, we've been tracking Bluetooth data for people coming in and out of that square to track traffic patterns. And we also have been able to very cheaply gather data on pedestrian and cyclist and transit use by once a year fanning out with a group of volunteers to track pedestrian and cyclist and transit use. And we have used that data to push more um, development toward those needs. And it's important to know that when you do those kinds of broad level data usage, you're getting everybody, regardless of socioeconomic status or language barriers or any other barriers that might prevent them from participating in your development processes. So, uh, so Tom, uh, you have a unique perspective working at a state level uh, working under a governor, but being able to kind of work on innovative opportunities uh, across the state, but also helping municipalities uh, approach technology in a new way. Um, could you share a, a couple of examples of, of where you've seen innovation and transparency actually have a, an impact in those types of ways? Sure. <clears throat> Absolutely. Good morning, everyone. So it's, uh, you mentioned part of it, what we're working on right now is e-permitting. And uh, <clears throat> we're actually building out a platform to standardize the permitting process for a number of the mechanical and trades permits and bring together a number of the communities into a standard workflow, standard routing and reporting, and being able to spur economic development that way. And we started this process going out to all the cities and towns in the state and saying, tell us about your process. Give us all your data to be able to track where in the process you're finding barriers and how we can potentially uh, create a platform for you to be able to modernize that process and also expose data on the back end to say, where is the real economic development happening? Uh, where are we seeing uh, spurred growth because we've improved that process and gone through the lean review? And how can we then bring in more of the communities in the state to be able to adapt that process? Not necessarily through the shame factor by saying, hey, it's working here, you need to come on board but proving that we're gaining efficiencies that way. So we're actually piloting that with 10 cities and towns in the state later on this year. And we're also doing it with the state building commissioner and fire marshal. And it'll actually help out a lot of the local owners as well as key developers, some of the large scale developers, to be able to get their projects up and running faster and to be able to bring money into those particular communities. We're also doing that on the municipal finance end 
We were able to go out and, um, through the Office of Municipal Finance at the state level, go back into those communities and talk to the tax assessors, talk to um, a number of the uh, tax um, practitioners and uh, also the groups that are, that are managing, collecting all that data. Now we've got one process through the Municipal Finance website and we're able to put that back out there so we can show where um, collections are happening and where we're seeing that kind of growth, where we can um, report on state municipal aid and see the impact and also be able to drive some of that cost down. So we've given them a, a standard process to be able to submit that type of data versus you know, a myriad of, <coughs> a myriad of spreadsheets mm -hmm. and paper-based forms that they would mm -hmm. send in and then it would require a lot of work on our back end. Interesting. That's great. So, Steve, um, knowing that there's a lot of policymakers uh, in the audience, um, can you talk a little bit about how you were able to uh, work through and champion some of the um, perceptions around opening data, um, and more so, what are you doing from a, you know a council member role uh, to help your peers, not only in different council districts but the city, actually think about doing innovative work? And, and what are you trying to lead through in terms of uh, policy initiatives? It's a really interesting question as a policymaker because I'm not a tech person. I, I come at this from a layman's perspective, in a lot of ways. But what I've encountered, and uh, we actually had a really fascinating conversation at a conference last year about shared services, uh, particularly things like Uber and Airbnb. But I find in a lot of policymakers, technology, um, because there's so many tragedies around the use of technology, becomes uh, fearful for people. But then you also combine that with just the idea of opening data. And certainly in a world where privacy is important, um, issues of opening data also make people feel insecure. What if my particular city is not doing a very good job? They're going to criticize me. They're going to, you know, the public is going to be unhappy. What if the data is manipulated to embarrass people? I think that the biggest challenge people have is just kind of letting go of those fears. And embedded in all that fear is a fear of failure. And I think that that fear of failure is a very unhealthy thing in government because part of being in government is right to get the feedback and uh, it's not generally about us it's more about how people perceive our, our municipality in a lot of ways and I'll tell you Sacramento has had a very positive experience with opening our data we're getting a lot of positive feedback from the public and how we respond to problems now uh, for instance we've been able to use data at our animal shelter to figure out where most of the cat the stray cats and the stray dogs come from in the city and that allows us to target programs to particular neighborhoods, to spay, to neuter, to really work with people to make sure that we have fewer of those stray animals from those neighborhoods. And that produces a big quality of life improvement. Uh, things like that are, are, are critical, but we wouldn't be able to do it in some ways if we weren't collecting, analyzing, and really coming up with ideas about how to employ that data. Um, some of that also comes, frankly, from our 311 app. We have, a on, we have uh, both an ability for people to call, traditional 311, and I bet many of your cities have that. But we also have an app, and we have a, we have a lot of, um, we're, we're using right now 311 2.0, which is sort of a more enhanced version, and ultimately gives a feedback loop also to the customer, so they know when that task is complete, and they can then give us feedback on how well it was done. But internally, we've been able to use these things, like on our, our garbage trucks, because we have GPS tracking, we know which drivers are doing well and which ones aren't based on speed, other factors. We've been able to reduce collisions um, between uh, refuse trucks and other cars or other property and dramatically decrease almost by half the number of collisions per year that those, those uh, vehicles encounter. And so what I would say is not to be afraid and the technology sometimes seems a little intimidating. Uh, find good people. I also say um, look at what other cities in your region might be already uh, rolling this stuff out and whether or not you can share that service. Shared services, whether it's an Uber, is one thing, and that's, that's really um, kind of an interesting way the public is connecting. But I think government can do the same. We can use the services that other municipalities or maybe the state is, is pioneering 
And oftentimes, though, I think the municipalities might be a little bit more entrepreneurial, you know, to uh, paraphrase Justice Brandeis. Uh, <laughs> the states may be the laboratories, but I think the cities are the petri dishes of democracy. But, but see, maybe you can um, contract with that other city or with the state to use their platform and their back-end services for your own uh, citizen engagement improvement of those problems. So I, think, I think that's a good point, if I yeah. can add to it. So that, that culture of failure is definitely something that municipal state government needs to be able to get over. It's a lot easier in the private sector to be able to spin up projects and to be able to uh, you know, go through and test and trial. But typically I find where I'll come in and ask for more right off the bat and, and take the approach of going way far out and then back off to be able to, to, be able to get to that testing period. But, but you also have a rapidity to how you test, right? Yes. So, so if it doesn't work right away, you don't give up Absolutely. and say, well, we tried that once. We're not going to do it again. Mm -hmm. You try to analyze why it didn't work, Absolutely. and then you try again a different way. And, and communicate that as much as possible. Right. But so, that speed of failure is really helpful in, in conquering some of these problems. Yeah, no, that's huge. Um, Steve, maybe another question. You, you talked a little bit just about you know, collaboration and participation across municipalities. But uh, living in Sacramento, you have engaged with this kind of community of hackers, right? And this word hackers scares people, right? I mean, how many of us have new debit cards that we've gotten in the last year because we shopped at Target or Home Depot, but um, what, what have you also or done to... we saw to, the 90s movie. Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, or or what, what have you done to create a culture or um, actually facilitate the engagement of these people that have incredible technology capacity, interest, and desires, and allow them to come in and actually work on these, you know, these key projects with the city? So um, I think that's a great question because everybody looks at Code for America. And, and we're lucky now. We actually have a Code for America project that's launching between our regional council of governments in the city of West Sacramento uh, and connecting urban communities to rural communities and uh, decreasing disparity and inequities between them, um, particularly around food access. So urban people want to eat. Rural people tend to farm. How do we connect those urban um, users to the rural producers? Um, but I would say in Sacramento, because not everybody has the expertise of a Code for America, we actually have a local brigade and um, a place called Hacker Lab, which is a nonprofit. And Hacker, I think, has a negative connotation, probably mostly because of the things that you mentioned or that 90s movie that is so um, kind of stereotypical. But what, what it means, as, at least as how I understand it, is you have a very difficult problem and you keep hacking away at it until you figure out how to solve it. And so we have um, an interesting community in that the tech business is largely, it looks like people like me. You know, it's great to have um, more people in it who are younger, but also our CIO is a woman, which I think is, is very important because we've got to get more women and girls into the profession and people from diverse backgrounds. So it's not so monolithic, and I think that brings its own value. But we have this local group of hackers um, that are trying to solve civic problems. Mm -hmm. You know, whether that's how do you identify all the uh, appropriate parcels in a city for urban gardens or, um, or urban farming? How do you um, take problems like our, our regional transit service this hacker group wanted to have real-time data so they could design an app so people would know when their buses were coming. And so we've worked on things like that, but it's only because the community has identified some of their needs. We've actually just launched a group called uh, Sacramento 2050, SAC 2050, and they're going to design a civic OS platform for citizen engagement around these kind of ideas. Um, and one of their first things is, uh, I don't know how many of you use NetFile. I don't know how many elected officials are out there and have to file your campaign finance disclosures. Well, NetFile is kind of like the de facto program, and it's almost a monopoly. And, you know, monopolies don't tend to be very um, entrepreneurial, and NetFile is very cumbersome. It's very clunky, and it produces data in largely inefficient ways to share with the public where people like me, elected officials, are raising money. So what our folks want to do is liberate that data and design an application that instead of um, having to dig through all these PDFs, you know, you can go online and much, much more easily 
access that net file data. And so we're working with this uh, SEC 2050 group to do just that. That's cool. So, Denise, on the topic of collaboration, and then I have another question for you, but um, the city of Somerville is fortunate to have a lot of universities, both around the community but also in the community, um, and you all have been able to achieve a, a level of partnership with Tufts. How did that come about, and, and how have you uh, made that a successful initiative between the city and leveraging their capacity as a university? So we consider ourselves to be immensely fortunate that we sit in what we call Boston's Research Triangle. So we sit between Harvard, MIT, and Tufts University, and we actually have a great deal of partnerships with all of them. And um, what you'll find is if you're trying to move into this area without having to invest a lot of your own financial resources is that the universities and the researchers are eager to use municipal data. They are eager to help. We have numerous classes at Harvard and MIT that take on very thorny, difficult projects for us, whether they're analyzing you know, right from the um, uh, ground level up how to even approach the issue or if they're coming in to help us develop uh, resources or tools once we've figured out what we need to do. Um, so we have We'll, we have classes that, that take on projects. We have professors that are um, very interested in specific areas that have worked uh, with us. And in, with Tufts in particular, because they have a very strong um, focus on education, um, they have partnered with our schools on multiple projects, and they'll be partnering with us on our Code for America mm -hmm. Fellowship as well. Um, but really, it's, it's as simple as a phone call. I mean, it, you'll, you'd be surprised how eager most of them, them are to get their... Um, hands on, on city data and city projects. So we, and it's, it's really been fruitful for us. That's great. So the other question that I have for you, um, you know, Somerville is population somewhere in the high 60s, less than 80,000, correct? Um, so, you know, as, as a smaller city, how did you go through the process of prioritizing open data and making room for the use of data? Um, it's, it, to some people may not appear as like a critical governmental service. How, how have you gone about institutionalizing data and like what is the return on investment been? Um, I'd say our mayor insisted on it. <laughs> so um, it really starts with leadership. Um, when Mayor Curtitoni came into office 11 years ago, we were using almost no data at all. And um, he started hiring analysts and pushing for this. But one of the things that really made this work was also building citizen support for this approach as well. So we have a program called ResiStat, which might sound like a medication, but it actually means resident, residents plus statistics. And we go out to each of the city's seven wards twice a year for community meetings where we don't just talk about issues, we throw up the data around them. Um, the most recent round, it's not gonna sound like it was exciting, but it was actually pretty cool. We went out and had uh, our residents be data analysts with all of our rodent activity data. And we let them walk through the process of looking at our initial data that we started with a few years back as we saw a spike in rodents and um, let them look at the map that, that showed that it was definitely an increasing problem. We let them look at the maps that showed um, where the hot spots were and work through what the potential problems uh, and sources of the problem could be and then help them look at the final data to figure out which of our policies and interventions seemed like they were working. And it was amazing to see everybody sitting forward and doing this. But when, so when you, when you build the expectation that this is how you make your decisions, people start expecting it and you can invest more into it. So um, that's, you know, we're at a point now where if, if we don't come out with data to back up a decision, everyone's asking for it. So it helps to have community support. Um, it's also important to remember there that you do have that return on investment. So our analysts um, do find efficiencies everywhere. Um, and in some cases, that's cost savings. And in other cases, it's, um, it's uh, life quality savings. So um, our crime analyst may not pay for himself in cost savings, although he has allowed us to figure out how to better deploy our force so that we can get more, more out of it. But he's also part of what has helped to drive down crime in the city by 30% over the last five years. It's not the only factor, but it's certainly a significant factor because he does a lot of predictive analytics that have helped us. So we save money, um, but you also have to have leadership and community support to remember that even if you are investing city resources, that it's worth it mm -hmm. in terms of your efficiency and the better decision making. It's helpful. So 
Tom, you talked a little bit about failure, right? And so uh, innovation, iterative, you know, sometimes it is about, you know, failing forward. Um, right. And sometimes it's, it's also about finding ways to uh, seed what could become a bigger opportunity. And so you talked a little bit about some of the, you know, kind of uh, big priorities that you all have uh, at the state. Um, are there things that you've been able to do from an investment perspective that almost have served as like seed investment for actually highlighting a bigger need that's allowed you to even go on and do deeper or more impactful work? Sure. Uh, we've certainly done some of that with the uh, revamp of the Department of Transportation website and some of the applications that ran off of that. We actually had <clears throat> a number of disparate applications that we brought together into a single interface and, and really took more of a user-centered approach to try to bring this big Department of Transportation uh, group together and say, okay, what do I really care about? What's happening in my community? What cameras are focused basically on my commute? Things like that. Um, we're doing the same thing at the DMV now, where we're going through and actually upgrading and replacing a 40-plus-year-old system to be able to make it much easier for people to get in and get out quicker and also, at the same time, transact with some of the other pieces of the state government and, and, and the municipal government because we have interfaces, 182 interfaces, to the municipal courts and to um, police and to tax so we're trying to surface that all within DMV. We're doing that in a small area. You can go in and take a look at where you stand on tax blocks as you come in and get your, your license. Typically, you'd come into the DMV and you would just be turned away because you had a tax block. You didn't have any access to that data mm -hmm. at that point in time with the transaction. So now we're actually taking more of a holistic user-centered approach and saying, how do we bring all that together to be able to you know, give them a clear picture all at once? One of the big ones seed money that's going to translate into something much larger. It's actually part of the Code for America work we did last year. We had three technologists that came in, and we had a number of great ideas. Uh, I think we had 110 or so that we <laughs> came up with, um, but boiled it down to two that we actually really focused on and accomplished, both in the education space. <clears throat> One was on what we called Golden Ticket. We liked a lot of the uh, Roald Dahl and Willy Wonka side of things. So we, did, we built Golden Ticket, and Golden Ticket... Run, now runs the state pre-kindergarten lottery application. So this went from a process that 90 plus percent of the people had to actually walk in and bring in paper forms. And we had two members from each school district that came in and sorted through all those paper forms. And it took about three plus weeks to go through all that. And in total, it took about 840 hours. Now we actually took all that business logic, all the process, all the demographic data, all the gender and geolocated data, and now run that whole 840-hour manually intensive process, which was about 30 people, and we run it in two seconds. So we were actually on a conference call at the end of this process, validating the process, validating the data, and with the Department of Education, and they said, okay, this sounds great. Yes, we give you sign-off. Go ahead and run it, and we'll, we'll talk to you guys. This was on a Friday, and we'll talk to you guys next week. And as soon as they finished that sentence, I said, it's done. <laughs> so we gave them the file, and um, they ran that pre-K uh, that pre-K locations in 16 different locations throughout the state. And because of that application now, we were able to go through a grant process and receive $2.3 million just for this particular area. And they're expanding from, 60, from 17, actually, to 60 locations. And it's mainly because they said, we have no administrative work to do. Yep. So it's a perfect example of how you can directly benefit the communities, and certainly in this case, the kids, to be able to get and get that education by taking data and standardizing processes and automating a lot of that work. That's great. Maybe just one thing yeah. to piggyback off that is I think sometimes people, the disruption that they fear from doing it differently you know, and we've talked a lot in the, this kind of space about disruptive innovation. I, I think that trying to control a process mm -hmm. that is a very sclerotic, bureaucratic Absolutely. process yeah. gives people some comfort, but it actually causes a lot of inefficiency, Definitely. but also probably causes a lot of harm because the opportunity to make errors in a manual process. Right. Right. And so to be able to do something so um, so 
um, amazing in it's kind of an alchemy probably for them that you did it in two seconds what took them 840 hours right. i mean as a policymaker, i love that because that means then those people are available to do other work that's right and and service the people that used to have to come in and go through this pretty cumbersome process well, that now well, can do that all online and actually follow up and talk about kind of the right. value add of how do my kid how does my kid get free lunch well, and the parents don't have to come down now, so <laughs> no, they're happy, right. they don't and they're to. not mad at us for ruining their day because they had to wait in line That's and deal right. with some bureaucrat, and you know. Right. So you're expanding that pool. Exactly. Well, exactly. You're, re- you're rebuilding that relationship that yeah. allows for a resilient community in terms of the interaction with government. So as there is a point of disaster or there's an issue, you have a rebounded sense of trust, and right. you know how uh, you know, to get people to engage. Right. Uh, we have just a, a few minutes left, but sure. um, would, would love for each of you maybe to share a couple of ideas and maybe specific examples from kind of the leadership roles that you've had. Um, what can the participants here do in going back home to their communities um, to think about increasing uh, engagement with their kind of entrepreneurial ecosystem to drive sustainability or resiliency efforts? Um, what can they do to promote the use of open data or what other tactics would you share with them that you think uh, would be really helpful to be able to take this knowledge back uh, and actually implement these types of things in their cities? Um, one of the, th- we have a very intensive community engagement uh, uh, efforts going on citywide really in Somerville and one of the things that's really important to remember is that if you just come out uh, trying to engage people about a development process or you know, it may, trying to make sure that that's equitable or if you just come out trying to engage them on data, you're going to hit these smaller subsets. So we, we try to be holistic about mm-hmm. it and pull people in all the time everywhere. <laughs> um, so, for example, we just had a week-long blizzard uh, cleanup and, uh, in Somerville and we've been on our social media feeds, which are free except for your staff, uh, from 7 in the morning till midnight, making sure we're accessible and available. Our 311 center was running 24-7. And so when we're engaging people on something like that, when they're really focused, then later when we're trying to engage them around a decision that's data-based or if we're trying to engage them around a development process, they're going to see the message on Facebook because we'll be higher in their feeds because they clicked on our snow emergency post. You know, or um, So it, 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 it has to be something that's ongoing and continuous every way possible um, is, is the thing that I would say that it, it it's, it's trying to be surgical about it. You're going to get these small subsets. Sure. So. That's huge. Steve? Uh, just obviously we've talked about it a little bit, but go home and try to provide some leadership. They're, they're in our IT departments or in some of our staff are the people who want to do this work, but often policymakers don't appreciate it because it's not as sexy to go and say, let's make an open data portal. But it really can change uh, the experiences in your cities. I would say, for me, I see four different kinds of innovation. Um, and, and think about what the problems are you face. So there's public innovation. That's a lot what we're talking about, how to make government better, how to make it more responsive and more effective. There's private innovation, the kind of things that we haven't really addressed today, um, things like Uber and Lyft and Airbnb and things that can really improve the potentially the economy in the community. but liberate resources that are now more bound, the kind of social innovation, you know, looking at problems like homelessness or literacy, how we really use technology and these ideas to to give our people better lives, and then kind of the political innovation of how we get people in office or in public life who are reflective of the the folks that they want to serve because that builds trust. It, It also reduces polarization, but as you go back... There are very simple tools, whether it's the, the Facebook or Twitter, even nextdoor.com, which we found for some of our smaller cities in the region, is a free tool that can be used like a neighborhood watch, can be used to communicate with the public, but it's less intimidating for folks than a Facebook or a Twitter because you have to have a physical address and then you're connected to your neighborhood and you can communicate only with your neighbors. And it really gives people a better sense of security. And that tool is free. Uh, but whatever type of solution, start somewhere. And I guess as a policymaker, push yourselves to be just a little bit uncomfortable. And, and I'm guessing that's the point where you're going to start to grow. Uh, I think testing is key. Um, getting out and actually asking all the right questions. I always talk about the value of curiosity. 
and really trying to delve down into what you could have for a proof of concept. Uh, when we use a number of free tools, uh, another one I would advocate for would be Tableau. Uh, it's a great tool to be able to visualize data, and it's online, works off of a number of different back-end uh, data systems where it could be as simple as an Excel spreadsheet. And uh, we've actually pushed that out to a number of the different state agencies and done training in each of those agencies to get people to actually manage that data and to be able to become analysts themselves. That's a big part of it. And really going in, and, and as I said before, asking for the moon and then, then dialing it back to be able to have those proof of concepts. That's great. Well, we're almost out of time, but I would share with you maybe uh, four key things that I think you could try to, to take home. Um, you know, first is, is take the notion of blowing up an RFP, right? So if, if you want to work with that entrepreneurial community, find ways for them to engage in, in whatever projects you are, are thinking about or working on. Um, second of all, you know, think about the idea of starting with a problem. Don't prescribe the solution that you think you need built, but again, let them understand what the problem is and ask them to bring solutions to those problems. You'll actually be surprised by the, the flow of activity uh, and ideas that you'll see back from them. Um, in, in that same spirit, you know, think about asking for help. Um, ask a local entrepreneur, ask a local student um, to help you host a hackathon. Um, you know, take a data set and say, here's a very specific data set. What can we do with it? Uh, we host uh, annually two uh, hackathons, and you're welcome to join us uh, all around the U.S. One's coming up February 21st and 22nd, uh, which is called Code Across America. And then later on in uh, June, maybe May, uh, we'll host National Day of Civic Hacking, which are massive events where, again, tons of technologists come together with their local government to work on key problems. And then I would say the fourth thing is, is look for ways to open data. Don't wait for a leader in your organization to drive it from a top-down perspective. There's a guy in Albuquerque who is probably one of the most legendary open data heroes. He's a guy that worked in IT, and he went around from every single department, meaning with every single one of his peers, saying, would you open this data? How can I help you open it? And so there are ways to do that, especially if you start, of, uh, start by thinking, how can we open data internally? to make sure that we're sharing data and optimizing efficiencies internally, and then it makes it much easier to publish the data externally. So uh, thank you all. We're all around the rest of the afternoon, so if you have questions, uh, please let us know, and thanks again for your time. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.